Thank you for having me here. Um, for those of you who have heard me talk before, you, usually I have an incredibly loud voice and I don't ever need to be wired up, but I've just got over a terrible bout of laryngitis and I'm singing The Good Fairy in a panto on Sunday, so I cannot wreck the voice that's left. <laughs> so I talk soft and hopefully the microphones will pick it all up. So what I want to talk to you today is just to give you an overview of some of the biological evidence because what I have to tell you isn't actually any different than what you already know. But what I want to do is tell you in a way that gives you the language that is persuasive to people who have the money. So you have to learn to speak their speak so you can get the money to do what you do and what you do really well. So that's what I want to give you in this talk today is just to give you that other speak, that other arguments that you can use to get your programs resourced and funded so you can do the stuff that you know that you do and that you do well. And so we'll start off by... The, the simple premise that what happens in the world outside of children actually affects the way their brain is wired up. And of course their brain is going to have a fairly big impact on the kind of people they're going to grow up to be. And so what we have to do is learn how that outside world impacts upon the brain so that we can then learn to manipulate that world to give children positive outcomes. Now, we've actually had research evidence that's demonstrated this for the last hundred years. What we haven't had in the past is the explanation as to how and why this happens. This is the result of a study done on children's maths achievement. And what you can see in this is that when children start school at six years of age, they're already, there are already significant differences in their achievement levels. Now, when you go to school in a country such as Australia, school is supposed to be the great leveller. You know, we all have equal opportunity to succeed because we all have this wonderful education system and whether we come from the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks, we could grow up to be the Prime Minister. But what we actually see in the research time and time again is that the differences that children bring into the schooling system aren't actually narrowed as they go through the system, they're actually widened. So those differences become wider. So by the time children leave school, those differences in outcomes are much greater than they were when they started school. So what we're doing in the schooling system is not actually overcoming disadvantage for our children. And here's a study on literacy levels, but it's showing a similar thing at the younger age group. What we can see is that there are already statistically significant differences in children's outcomes by the time they're two years of age. So something's happening to children in those first few years of life and there is nothing that we are currently doing that is turning that around. So children's feet are set on those pathways and systemically there's nothing we are doing to change that. Which is a bit scary when you think we're supposed to be a country of equal opportunity. And it's not just about school achievement. It's linked to a whole pile of outcomes. Physical health, mental health, literacy levels, for example, we know are related to life expectancy. We know in countries such as Australia and New Zealand, for example, the difference in life expectancy between children born to the lowest socioeconomic levels and children born to the highest socioeconomic levels can be as much as nine years of age. So nine years difference in life expectancy. And we're not overcoming that disadvantage with what we are currently doing. And that disadvantage is set up in the first couple of years of life. And so what we have to do is we really have to understand what's happening to children in those first couple of years of life so that we can be effective in overturning it. Because if we don't understand it, how can we actually address it? And there's two pathways that I want to talk to you about that actually take that outside world and turn it into the interior world of the child. And there's a neurological pathway and there's a biochemical pathway. They both have a lot to do with stress, so I'll be talking a lot about stress. And they also involve a new science called epigenetics. Now epigenetics as a science is probably around five, six, seven years old. It's really new. So if you want to go home and impress your teenage kids, you can say you went to a conference today about epigenetics and they'll think you're just absolutely wow because it is so new. And epigenetics is about how the environment actually takes the genes that you've got and switches them on and off. So it's not just enough to know your genetic messages. You have to actually know the environment in which you grow up 
because that environment will turn those messages on or off. And so I'll talk a little bit about that too. Okay, so if we start with the neurological pathway, we're born with a whole pile of brain cells. We don't think we actually manufacture any more brain cells once we're born. What you've got is it. We're really good at killing them off. Every party we have, we kill a few more off, but we can't actually grow them. And some of those brain cells are connected up into pathways that work. So the brain cells that control our breathing, they're connected up. From the moment we're born, we get messages that say breathe, and they work. Because if they didn't work, we wouldn't be sitting here. So those pathways connect up in the brain, and they work fine. Other pathways aren't connected up or not connected up so well. Vision's another example. We know that a newborn baby doesn't see the way that an adult sees. And it's actually light from the world outside going into the child's eyes, hitting the retina, trying to go from the retina to the visual cortex that actually forces the brain to lay down the pathway to actually take that signal to the visual cortex. So if light's not going into the eyes, it doesn't happen. And we have a really good example of that with the kitten research that was done a long time ago. You know that when kittens are born, they're born with their eyes closed, so there's no light going in. And around about six weeks of age, the kitten's eyes open, the light goes into the eyes, it forces the brain to lay down pathways, and the kitten can see. But if you put a bandage over the kitten's eyes before they open up, and you leave that bandage over the eyes for about a month, and then you take the bandage off, that kitten is blind for life. And it's blind for life because at that very critical point in its development, when the brain needed to get light to lay down those visual pathways, the brain didn't get the light because you blocked it. And the kitten has a very critical period in development. If the light goes in after that period, it's too late. The brain can't reorganize. Human beings don't have such critical periods in their development. They tend to have sensitive periods. So there's points in our development when it's really easy. If the information goes in, our brains lay down the pathways, it's so easy we don't even know it's happening. And if we miss that really easy time, our brain can still organise itself, but it gets harder and harder the further away we get from that sensitive period. And so we get something like this for human development where we are sensitive to different inputs at different times in our lives. So that hearing and vision, for example, start the pathways start to be laid down prenatally. So that the baby's already born with some pathways for hearing and vision. And in those first few months of life, it's really important that the baby's surrounded by sound and sight so that those pathways get laid down. And that's why doctors make such a fuss about dealing with eye problems like squints very early in life so that the light will get in properly into the brain early enough. That's why a child who has a um, bionic ear implanted doesn't actually just learn to hear like that. You have to have a really sophisticated oral stimulation program to teach a child who's got a bionic ear implant to hear, because it doesn't just happen. Those pathways aren't there. And if you've missed that sensitive period, you've got to be really programmed and organised and specific about getting that information in to force the brain to rewire. So, in the first few years of life, what we have is we have all this information from the outside world going into the brain and laying down pathways. So that by the time the child's three, you have three times as many pathways in the brain as you have in an adult brain. Now, we can see that if we just look at the gross size of the baby's brain. That's why child health nurses measure head circumference. Because if the head isn't growing at that vast rate of knots, then we know there's some real problems with establishing brain connections. And of course, it needs a huge amount of energy to feed that kind of brain growth. This is why nutrition deprivation in the first couple of years of life has such lifelong consequences. You know, we deprive ourselves as adults of food on a regular basis and we call it dieting and we don't actually suffer all that much from it apart from feeling hungry and being grumpy. But for children, if they have restricted food intake at this point in their lives, you're talking about long-term brain impact because there isn't the fuel to feed the kind of growth that needs to be happening at that point in development. But what happens is that because we've got, by the age of three, three times more neurons than we have, the brain gets too complex. It just cannot function properly. 
So a piece of information goes in and it can go down one of a gazillion different pathways to get to where it needs to go. Now that's not efficient functioning. It just doesn't work very well. It's too complex. And so the brain goes through a pruning, pruning process. And that somewhere between the age of three and the age of 12, we start pruning away pathways. And if you want to do the maths, it's about 33 connections <coughs> per second every second of the day, every day of the year for those years. It's a huge amount of brain connections that we lose. And the brain connections that we lose are the ones that haven't been stimulated sufficiently. So if you haven't had stimulation to really strengthen a particular pathway, then that pathway is going to get pruned away. Now that explains why for some of us learning a second language as adults, you can't get your tongue around some of the sounds and you can't hear some of the sounds. And you think you're pronouncing the word perfectly and everyone around you is rolling around in hysterics because it's so funny. Whereas a child growing up in a bilingual family will maintain the ability to hear and speak the sounds of both languages. Because for us growing up in a monolingual family, you haven't heard particular language sounds. The pathways in your brain that would process those sounds are pruned away. They weren't st stimulated. And with the development of MRI technology, we're actually now starting to get evidence that, that can back all this stuff up. In the past, before MRI technology, all of this came out of autopsy information. And ethics committees get a bit upset when you have to actually autopsy your participants. They don't like it, especially when they're living participants. MRI scans make it much easier. So you can see here that in the brain of the newborn baby, there's some brain cells and there's lots and lots of white space. The six-year-old, you've got a much more complex brain. There's brain cells everywhere, all connected up, making pathways. By the time you get to the 14-year-old, you've got some pruning taking place, a bit more white space, a bit more organisation in those pathways and what's going on. Okay, just transport yourself back to yesterday when you were in high school biology and think about what you learned about the brain. <coughs> we can generally talk about the brain as having two areas, the upper brain and the lower brain. The lower brain is the part of the brain that deals with all of our automatic functioning. So it controls things like our heart rate and our blood pressure and our breathing and our levels of arousal and all of those things that happen that we're not consciously thinking of, but they certainly happen. And the upper brain is the part of the brain that deals with things like thinking, our cognition, our language, our problem solving, all of those kinds of things, establishing our relationships, all of those things. Now there's a neurologist called Bruce Perry who suggests an analogy here that's really useful to help understand what we're talking about. Bruce Perry says, let's think about those signals coming out of the lower brain as coming out 10 strong. So right now you're getting 10 strong messages that say, okay body, breathe, breathe this fast. Okay body, you're going to be this alert. So those messages are coming to you at 10 strong. The messages that come out of your upper brain are coming at you at 20 strong. Let's imagine we've got little Johnny sitting in this room. And little Johnny hears a car backfire outside. Now he hears a 10 strong message saying, sudden noise, this could be dangerous. Heart, you better beat faster so I've got some more energy in case I have to run like mad from that hairy mammoth who could be coming thundering through that door any minute. So the message is about the heart rate, the blood pressure, the levels of arousal in response to that sudden sound are coming out of little Johnny's brain 10 strong. So the heart goes faster, the blood pressure goes up, Johnny's alertness goes up. But Johnny has a 20 strong upper brain and Johnny's 20 strong upper brain says, uh-uh, no hearing mammoths here in Adelaide, you're quite safe, calm down, relax, it's just a noise outside. Now that message is coming at 20 strong. It's very easy for that 20 strong calm down message to override the 10 strong message that says be alert, watch out, there could be something happening. And so in little Johnny's behaviour, you might not actually see anything because that 20 strong message is, is overriding the 10 strong message very, very easily. But let's say little Johnny had grown up in a situation of domestic violence. Now in a situation of domestic violence, 
You are nervous a lot of the time. You're anxious a lot of the time. Your alertness levels are up a lot of the time. Because you're nervous and anxious, your breathing is increased. Your heart rate is increased. Your blood pressure is up a lot of the time. And so the pathways that control your breathing and your blood pressure and your levels of alertness are being stimulated more than they should be. And so instead of being wired up to a 10 strong, those pathways could get wired up to a 12 strong or maybe even a 14 strong. Now let's imagine little Johnny sitting here with a 2014 brain and he hears the car backfire outside. He's getting a 14 strong message that says you could be in danger and he's only getting a 20 strong message saying calm down. And so it's going to be harder for that 20 strong message to override that instinctive response. And so you may well see something in little Johnny's behaviour now that you didn't see in your behaviour with your 2010 brains. And so little Johnny might do a bit of a jump. He might stop listening to me for a minute and he might kind of look around the room and check what's going on. And his heart's thumping a bit and his blood pressure's up and he might get a bit of a flush in his face to represent the higher blood pressure for a moment. And while he's looking around the room and checking where that hairy mammoth's coming from, he's not listening to me. And so he's just lost some learning opportunities. Now, if little Johnny is growing up in a situation not just of domestic violence, but let's say he's also growing up in an environment where he's not getting lots of nice stimulation for learning. So the only language he hears from the adults around, now get the F out from under my feet, go away, go and play. Or plonk down in front of TV, sh sit down, shut up, don't move. So he's not getting lots of nice interactions. He's not getting lots of nice problem solving and learning opportunities. So when we start to do the brain pruning, some of the pathways in the brain that deal with language and cognition and thinking and problem solving are actually going to get pruned away. And so little Johnny might end up with an 18 upper brain or maybe even a 16 upper brain. Now if little Johnny's sitting here with a 16, 14 upper brain and there's a backfire outside, what do you think you're going to see in his behaviour? Are you going to call him impulsive, hyperactive, Yes? Because what he's doing is he's reacting to the way his brain is wired up. And so you see much more of that lower brain instinctive stuff in his behaviour because his upper brain is unable to override those signals as quickly or as comprehensively as he might otherwise have done. So what does this tell us children need when they're growing up? It tells us they certainly need the learning opportunities and the stimulation to wire the upper brain to the 20. That's really important. We want the 20 upper brain, so we want all those lovely adult-child interactions. We want the language. We want the problem solving. We want the learning opportunities. But we want to make darn sure that we wire up a 10 lower brain, not a 12 or a 14. So we want those learning opportunities to be offered in a context that's not going to stimulate that stress response in Johnny, which is our biological justification for what we've known for the last hundred years, the play-based child-centered learning. Because that's the kind of learning opportunities where children feel safe and in control so that they can then develop that 20 upper brain. So that's the neurological evidence. Now we have to add to that the biochemical evidence to really make our argument solid. And that comes back to that stress stuff I just talked about. We have a biological stress reaction that we've evolved <coughs> to help us deal with danger. We may control how we express it. Our 20 upper brain might mean that it might be churning around inside of us but we still sit down calmly and listen. Or not listen as the case may be. We don't have that reaction triggered these days from hairy mammoths. Well, not real hairy mammoths, but there in fact are a lot of hairy mammoths in our modern day lives. And those hairy mammoths in our modern day lives are things that cause us to feel anxious or nervous or stressed or uneasy or unsafe. And if we're hungry and we're thirsty or we're sick, all of those things will cause this biological reaction to happen in us and in our children. And there's a whole pile of things that happen biochemically when, these, when we're feeling like this. But the one that I want to talk to you about, because it's the one we can use most easily in the research, is the cortisol part of it. 
So when we're feeling nervous or anxious or uneasy or sick or any of those things, our body releases cortisol. Now cortisol has a particular job. If we're going to have an increased heart rate, it's going to take more energy to fuel our heart to beat faster. And we can't make energy from nowhere. So cortisol's job is to pinch that extra energy from other parts of our body and feed it into our heart rate, our blood pressure, our levels of arousal. Now I guess, again, through natural selection, through evolution, there were certain things that the body really didn't need when it was running like mad from the hairy mammoth. Rational thinking and problem solving is one of those areas. If you're running like mad from the hairy mammoth, you're not actually calculating the angles to the tree, you're just running for it. So when we are stressed, when we have cortisol floating around in our body, cortisol will turn off the parts of our brain that we use for rational thinking, for problem solving, for remembering things. And the energy that normally feeds those things is taken to feed our extra heart rate, our extra blood pressure, our extra levels of arousal. What that means is that if we are biologically stressed, and remember we may not see you are biologically stressed because your 20 upper brain might override the, the out outward signals, but if you are biologically stressed, the parts of your brain you need to use to learn with are turned off. So you might be sitting in that classroom quite calmly, not causing any trouble, but the teacher's voice is going completely over your head, you're not connecting with it because the part of your brain that you need to engage with that learning is turned off. Now what should happen, and happens for a lot of us, when the stress is over, the hairy mammoth has given up, you got to the tree safely, you're sitting in the top branches, the hairy mammoth's gone off to chase your friend, really good friend, and you're sitting up there in the tree and your brain says, okay, I'm safe now. I'm perfectly safe, this is fine. So we turn off the switch, we stop producing cortisol. The cortisol floating around in our system gets reabsorbed. Our cortisol levels drop back down to, to what they should be. Our rational thinking, our memory gets turned on again, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our arousals drop back to normal and we can sit up there in the top of that tree and figure out how we're going to get down safely and get back to the cave. That's what should happen. But, if you are stressed a lot of the time, then you have cortisol floating around in your system a lot of the time. So if little Johnny's stressed a lot of the time sitting in your classroom or your centre or whatever you're doing in your playgroup, and he's stressed a lot of the time, then the parts of his brain that he needs to use to learn with are switched off a lot of the time. So all those brilliant learning opportunities you're creating for him are actually going right over his head because he can't engage with them. Now that's bad enough, but cortisol has a double whammy. Cortisol actually damages brain cells. And the brain cells that are really susceptible to damage are the on-off switch for cortisol production. So that if little Johnny's growing up in an environment of chronic stress, the chances are he will have that cortisol switch damaged. And the chances are it will jam either in the on position or jam in the off position. And if it's jammed in the on position, then Johnny's going to have high cortisol floating around his system a lot of the time. And he can do the most brilliant yoga in the world and he's still going to end up swinging from the chandeliers because he's just on, switched on all the time. And the long-term consequences of that, as we know, are things like the adults who have heart attacks and strokes in their 30s. We have a whole pile of behaviour problems, hyperactivity, we have learning problems because Johnny's not able to learn because he's biologically switched off. We have all the social consequences that come with school dropout, teenage pregnancy, juvenile delinquency, drug and alcohol addictions, you know that pathway once children's feet are set on it. <coughs> and jamming the switch in the off position is just as dangerous because what you have is a child who can't get that oomph to actually engage in anything. This is the child who sits calmly in the back of the room, doesn't engage, can't get the energy to get up and do anything and the world's just kind of floating on by. <coughs> and we often overlook that child because they're not swinging from the chandeliers. But they're still at major risk. And there are a whole pile of physical health outcomes, as you can see there, there from, from those things. 
This is where we get to the epigenetics. And there's a researcher in the States called John Meany, and when you think about what he does, it's a wonderful surname for him. He, he must have known when he was born what he was going to grow up to do. And what John Meany has done is he's bred two distinct lines of rats. So we have the genetic good rats. And the genetic good rats are born big and healthy, and they've got this lovely sleek coat, and they're really smart rats. And you put them in the maze and they'll solve the maze and get to the end really quickly. And they live nice, healthy, long lives. And good rats make good rat parents. So the mother rat will groom the baby and, and really look after the rat pup. And when she lies down, she lies down in a way that the baby can easily get to the teat and feed. And she's a really good rat mother. And every genetic good rat pup born to a genetic good rat mother will breed true. <coughs> So we can breed good rats for generation after generation after generation, 100% good rats. Then we have the bad rats. And the bad rats are skinny and they're unhealthy and they're sickly, they don't live as long, they're not very smart, you put them in the maze and they kind of cower in the corner and won't figure out how to solve it, and they're really shocking parents. They don't lick the babies or groom them or look after the babies. The bad rat mum will just flop down any which way and sometimes the babies can get to the teeth and sometimes they can't. And bad rat babies will grow up to be bad rats. Generation after generation after generation, 100% guaranteed. So we have our good rats and our bad rats, very distinct genetically. You can change that with one generation of cross-fostering. You can take a bad rat pup at birth, foster it with a good rat mother, and that bad rat will grow up to be a good rat. But the scariest thing of all is it will not just grow up to be a good rat itself, but its children, its grandchildren, its great-grandchildren, and so on will be good rats. Because what that mothering has done has actually switched on some genes and switched off some others. And so that, that bad rat pup will grow up to have good rat great 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 grandchildren forever after. And we can do the reverse. We can take a good rat pup and foster it with a bad rat foster mother, turn some other genes on and off, and we can then create a generation of bad rats coming out of that what was a genetically good rat pup. Now you might say that work with rats is fascinating, but apart from a few human beings who I won't name, we're not actually that close to rats. We, again, ethics committees get a bit upset when we suggest doing this work with humans. The closest that's been done to humans genetically is work with rhesus monkeys. And exactly the same things are shown in rhesus monkeys. That one generation of cross-fostering will change the outcomes, not just for that child, but for subsequent generations. Think about what that means for human beings. Think about how that might explain some of the research that's now coming out about the long-term impacts of the stolen generation. The West Australian Indigenous Child Health Survey, for example, showed that grandchildren of those who were stolen still have significantly different physical and mental health outcomes compared to indigenous children who come from families where there wasn't a stolen parent or grandparent. It starts to make sense, doesn't it? So how can we prevent these things? Certainly we have to minimise stress in children's lives. Yes, we all need that little burst of stress to, you know, as you're falling asleep and you fall off the chair and you jerk yourself awake, that will keep you awake for the next ten minutes. So we need that little bit of stress occasionally. But we need to have that burst and it needs to then go down so we can engage in the world around us. And so what we have to do if we're looking at what are quality rearing environments for children, we have to look at where are children not stressed. And children are not stressed when they feel safe, when they feel secure, when they feel confident, when they feel what else have I got? When they're not hungry, thirsty, uncomfortable, and they're not sick. So those are the things that we have to use to define a quality rearing environment for young children. <coughs> now, again, there's been research for the last hundred years that's told us that, but we've never actually figured out how to put it all together and how to explain it. 
There's been research for a long time that said when children start school from loving, caring family backgrounds, they do better academically. They do better socially. They have better physical and mental health. We've known that for decades. What we also now know is children who come from those loving, caring backgrounds have a, a, a lesser stress peak. So on that first day of school, which stresses everybody out, including the parents, Johnny comes into school on that first day from a loving, caring background, his stress peaks up here. That's normal. But by the end of the first day, he's starting to feel safe and comfortable, his stress levels go down, and by the end of the first day, he's starting to be able to, already starting to be able to learn from that school environment. Little Freddie comes into that school on the first day from a, a, a more disadvantaged background where he hasn't had that safety and security. His stress peak is way up there somewhere. And by the end of the first term, his stress peak is still up there. It hasn't come down. And so Freddie's just lost a whole term's worth of learning. No wonder we see disadvantage being exacerbated <coughs> through the schooling years rather than ameliorated. So, quality environments for children are environments where children feel loved and safe and confident. And we know that children feel loved and safe and confident and secure in environments where they are in loving relationships. So we come back to love, which for years was like the big outside. You don't talk about love, it's not professional, it's not scientific, you don't love. It's not cool. Well, now the most professional thing you can do when you're working with kids is fall in love with them. Because it's in that loving relationship that they feel safe and secure, their stress levels go down, and then they can take advantage of all those wonderful learning opportunities you're creating for them. So falling in love is utterly professional. And there we come to the research that I've been doing. And what I was doing was looking at the cortisol levels of children in childcare settings. Now to interpret those graphs, there's one more piece of information you need. And that is that we don't have cortisol that's the same across the day. It doesn't work like that. We start off the day with really high cortisol. Presumably when you woke up in the cave and you had to go out and forage for food, you had to have really high cortisol levels so you could be awake and alert and watch out for that hairy mammoth. And then as the day goes on, your cortisol levels should go down. So that when you go to bed at night, you should have really low cortisol levels so that your heart rate's down, your arousal's down, and you can actually go to sleep without swinging from the chandeliers. So that's how it should work. Now if you look at those graphs, you can see that the blue line actually shows us that. Now the blue line is the cortisol levels of children who were in childcare centres where using the QIAS system, everything was, rate, it was rated as high quality. So in high quality childcare, we see that children's cortisol levels go down. Look at the red dotted line. That's the cortisol levels of children in childcare where the program they were experiencing was rated as unsatisfactory using the national QIIS definitions. So in unsatisfactory childcare, cortisol levels are going up. Children's learning is going to be affected by that experience. Now that's using the overall summing up all of the quality principles. I really wanted to unpack that data and look at different aspects of quality. Because if you know anything about childcare, you know that there are over 50 principles that define good quality practice. If you're paid less than a person who picks up the garbage, you're working appallingly long hours in an industry that has no support whatsoever, your ability to be brilliant at everything you do is going to be somewhat limited. So if you can't be brilliant at everything, one of the things that you really have to be brilliant at, one of the really important things in terms of children's outcomes, so I divided up the data and looked at children's <coughs> cortisol levels with the principles that related to relationships. These are the old principles, um, and those of you who are in childcare will know all about those. Principle 1.1 is a, a measure of the interactions between caregivers and children. And unfortunately for the research, there were not enough children in centres that were doing this at the unsatisfactory level to include unsatisfactory in the statistical analysis. That's great for the kids, but it sucks for the research. <laughs> These are all statistically significant, by the way, if you really want to get into research speak. 
So what we see here is that in services where the relationship dimension of the practice is at high quality, the cortisol goes down across the day. Where the relationship dimensions are at satisfactory and services can be accredited at satisfactory, we actually see the cortisol barely changes. So what this is telling us is that in terms of relationships, satisfactory is nowhere near good enough. Relationships have to be at the high quality level. Now, if you're not an early childhood person, and you guys all are, but if you're someone else from another area, Joe Blow in the street, um, the consumer of ABC advertising, <laughs> if we ask all of those people, what do you think makes a high quality early childhood program, most people would say it's about the learning, or the curriculum, or the program, or whatever words you want to do. ABC targeted that in their advertising all the time, didn't they? Come along to our centres, your child will learn and be prepared for school. <coughs> so the curriculum, the program, the learning is often perceived as the, the indicator of a quality program. So I wanted to look at children's cortisol using those, in childcare speak we talk about programming rather than curriculum, but it's the same thing. So looking at the curriculum or the programming dimensions of quality, and what you can see in that graph is that where the programming dimensions are high quality and where they're satisfactory as well, children's cortisol levels go down across the day. And it's only when those things are operating at the unsatisfactory level that children's cortisol levels are going up. So what that's telling us is in a world where it's actually impossible to be perfect at everything you do, you really need to be perfect at the relationship stuff and as long as you do your programming and it's okay, the kids will be fine. So it tells us what is priority in working with young children. The relationship dimensions of care are number one priority. Now these graphs that I've shown you are the graphs for what we call the kindy age group, which is your three to six year olds. We analyze the data separately for the infants and tots because we thought that infants and tots are more vulnerable Kindy age kids might be able to get some of their relationship needs met through friendships with peers because they're developing those skills. Infants and toddlers can't. They're utterly dependent upon the adult. And so what we saw is that in all of the dimensions of quality for infants and toddlers, we had to have high quality. Here you've got a comparison. The graph you've just seen on your left and the same principle for the babies on the right. So you can see that for the babies, satisfactory is nowhere near good enough. It has to be high quality. And there, of course, is why we have to have different ratios for the younger children, because younger children are much more dependent upon the adults. And if we have to have super high quality for everything, we've got to have more adults around to do it because it's just not physically possible. And I know that in Western Australia, we're starting to argue to go back to what we once had, which was one to three for babies. I know New South Wales has just won their one to four campaign. Well, we're now gonna start pushing for one to three. Now, if you don't remember anything else about this morning, this is the one thing I want you to remember. And this is, that if children are feeling anxious, nervous, scared, worried, uncertain, unsafe, hungry, thirsty, sick, if they're feeling any of those things, there will be a biological stress reaction. You may not see the outward signs of that stress reaction, but it will be happening inside of the child. And if it is happening inside of the child, then you can have the most brilliant, developmentally appropriate learning activity that anyone could ever dream of setting up and it's going to go completely over the kid's head because they won't be able to learn from it. You've got to prioritise the relationships that will enable the children to feel safe and secure with you or with mum and dad or with whoever they are. If we don't do that, and we're not doing it very well, particularly in our schooling system. I mean, how can an early years teacher develop those secure, loving, trusting relationships with 30 kids in the class? I mean, get real. And if we, don't, if we continue to run our services in ways that don't prioritise our relationships with the children, 
then we're going to see continuing increase in prevalence of all of the outcomes that Fiona Stanley's been warning us about since she was the Australian of the Year. And she's been saying this loudly and clearly for a long time now. This country is seeing increasing rates of behaviour problems for children, increasing rates of drug and alcohol addictions, uh, juvenile delinquency, teenage pregnancy, suicide in teenagers. All of those things are getting worse. And they're getting worse because we're not actually dealing with their fundamental causes. We're putting our thumb in the dike. We're not rebuilding the dike from ground up and making it proper. And that's what we have to think about. Now, it's a bit tempting to say, okay, look, Johnny's brain's wired up. He had a really bad start. His brain's wired up. He's got a 16, 14 brain. Too late, mate. You've missed out. Forget Johnny. We'll start with Freddie, his newborn brother. Well, we can't do that, can we? I mean, that would not be moral. And I like to think of the analogy of a stroke. If you've ever had a family member or a friend with a stroke, you'll know there's quite significant brain damage. Let's say there's brain damage in the motor part of the brain. The person can't walk after the stroke. They go off to physiotherapy while they're in the hospital. And they have physiotherapy every day for months and months and months. And then they are discharged and they go back in as an outpatient. And for a year or a couple of years, they'll keep going for physiotherapy. And with that kind of intensive input, the brain can be forced to rewire around that damage. And the person may never run the Boston Marathon again. And they may need a caliper to walk or maybe a walking frame. But you can force the brain to rewire around the damaged areas with that intensive input. Well, we do that for stroke victims with physiotherapy. Who does that for the child who's grown up in a family with no loving relationships and who hasn't got the part of the brain wired up to deal with love and care and empathy? Who does that? Foster parents? Do we support foster parents the way we support physiotherapists? That's a bit sad, isn't it? Now, this is a really important graph. Because this is the graph you wave under the nose of the people who develop policy and to give you your funding. And what this graph tells us, this is the graph done by Jim Heckman. Now, you're all familiar with Jim Heckman's work? Yeah? So I don't need to go into how he did it? Please do? Okay. Jim Heckman is an economist. He won a Nobel Prize for his work. Not this work. He won his Nobel Prize for something to do with international currency exchange, which I can't understand at all. But then after he did that work, he started to get interested in early childhood. Perhaps he became a grandparent at that point or something. So he started to look at all the research that was done around the world on early childhood and on intervention in general. Because he was an economist, he did what economists do and turned it into dollars. And so the kind of work that was done in the Perry High Scope program. So you're familiar with Perry High Scope? Yeah? So the 1 to 17 for the Perry High Scope, for example, is the kind of stuff that he used to create this graph. So what he did is he looked at the cost of intervention programs at different points in the lifespan and then said, what's the return on the investment? So for the Perry High Scope <coughs> program, for example, the return on the investment was um, decreased welfare dependency, so less welfare spending. These kids were more successful in education, more successful in getting jobs. So because they had jobs and better paid jobs, they paid more money to the state as tax. So less welfare spending, more income for the state in tax. These kids were healthier because of the early intervention, so less hospital spending. They were less likely to offend, so they were less likely to be in jail, so less spending on justice. So all of those benefits for the program, you could turn into dollar signs and talk about return on investment. And so what we now have from Perry High Scope for example, is that at 40, 40 years of age, after being in the early intervention program, the return on investment is $17 for every $1 spent on the cost of the intervention itself. And so we see that reflected in the left-hand side of the graph. When we intervene in the early years of life, the long-term economic benefit is huge. When we intervene in the school years of life, which we do through our education system, Yes, it makes a difference, but the difference is, is actually less than half of the long-term difference that we can see if we intervened in the early years. And if we intervene at the end or the transition to employment, 
Yes, it makes a difference. But you can see the difference there on the right is minuscule compared to the difference in the early years. So this is the kind of graph that says if you want to turn society around, if you really want to cut those rates of youth suicide, juvenile delinquency, drug and alcohol addiction, behaviour problems, school dropouts, all of those things, if you really want to make a difference in those things, the most economic and efficient way to make a difference in those things is to invest in those early years of life and get them right. Now, I'm not saying we should stop investing in schools and put all that money into the early years, because that wouldn't be right either. And so people look at me and they say, Margaret, you live in a dream world. You're an idealist. You know, there just isn't enough money. We've got all this money in schools. You say, don't take it out of the schools. Where are we going to get the money from to put that kind of money into the early years? And when they say that to me, I come up with this one. This is a conference I went to a long, long time ago, and I suspect the figures would be actually much worse now. And the keynote speaker got up and gave us this piece of information, and I think it's an incredibly powerful piece of information. And if people accuse you of being a dreamer, you can hit them over the head with this piece of information. <coughs> so what the keynote speaker at this particular conference had done is he calculated the amount of money spent around the world in 1999 on military technology and military training. So only technology and training, not wages, nothing else. Technology and training. 5% <coughs> of that money, only 5% of that money would have made sure that every human being on this planet had basic education, <coughs> basic health care, drinkable water and sanitation. Every human being on this planet, and it's only 5%. It's not actually a lot, is it? And we don't do it. Because clearly we think that fighting people is more important than supporting people and looking after our kids. And Time magazine a couple of months ago gave the figures for the cost to America of the war in Iraq. And America, two or three months ago, was spending $12.5 million every five minutes. I only want five minutes. It's not a lot to ask for, is it? <laughs> it's not about we don't have money. It's about we don't think that our children are important enough to divert the money from these other areas. And that's where you can change things. Because we need to have the voices out there demanding the kind of changes we need to take that 5% of that money or that five minutes of spending and put it into kids instead of military technology. It's not asking a lot at all. So we need to have a society that actually thinks our kids are important. Because until we think our kids are important, we'll continue to spend money on beating people up, as we do now. We need to have communities that make it easy for people to parent. How can you be a good parent in our communities when you can't go down and play in the local park without sifting the sandpit under the slide to make sure there are no needles in it. And if you have to sift the sandpit to get the needles out before your kids can play, you don't go to the park. And so you'll plop your kid down in front of TV and they get obese and you get growled at. Come on, get real. So we have to create communities that really are child friendly. So our families and our children can be out there and can engage and can build relationships with people. And they can't do that when the communities aren't safe. We have to have services that allow us to do what we have to do instead of having stupid bureaucratic rules stop us. I know when I was running family support, my staff did, but weren't allowed to, put people in cars and take them to doctor's appointments because if you put a client in your car, there were insurance implications for your car. Now that's a load of rubbish. You know, if we're going to really support families, we've got to have the flexibility to do what it is we need to do to help them get a quality of life so that they can parent their children effectively. And we've got to challenge the stupid rules that stop us from doing those things. We've got to drive that change. Because if we're silent, the world will carry on the way it's going now. We're the ones who know this stuff. We're the ones that have to get out there and tell everybody and drive that change. Change happens when enough people demand it. We've got to get out there and create that groundswell, not just ourselves, but our families 
our communities, <coughs> share the information with them, help them drive that change. Family support is crucial. What you are doing is absolutely fundamental to that. You are getting out there, you are empowering families, you are working with families to drive that change and that change will make their lives easier. And ultimately, someone out there is tomorrow's Prime Minister. And when I retire, I'm really hoping and praying that the kid who's the Prime Minister at that point actually had an environment that surrounded him with empathy and love and wired up those pathways. Because if he was wired up with economic rationalism, I'm stuck. <laughs> and I think that's time to stop. 